Our uh, first reading this morning, the readings will be different than what is written there in your bulletins. Um, it comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 through chapter 4, verse 10. And you can find that on page 928 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Listen to the word of God. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that we may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all called avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. This is the word of God. Our second reading is from the second book of Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our fathers and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God in your steadfastness, steadfastness and faith, in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considered it just to repay with, with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us, when the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel and our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all those who believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the final book of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Nardia series, The Last Battle, we find the heroes of, in the land of Nardia, 
including two English children named Jill and Eustace. Eustace, fighting an Armageddon-like battle at the end of time. Eventually, our heroes, in the heat of battle, get backed into a dark, mysterious stable, and as a lacked act of heroism, they are pushed in. But when they go through the stable door, they find that they're not in the stable at all, but rather a bright and beautiful land. They soon realize that they have entered Aslan's country, or what we would call heaven. And there at the entrance, they find good friends and unexpected guests. There they also see Aslan, the great lion, the Christ figure of the Narnia series. Aslan calls all the animals and the people of Narnia to come before him for a judgment, sending those who hate him to the left and those who love him to the right. And then he bids all those who love him to go further up and further in. He bids them to run, to run without growing tired, and to go deeper, to go more deep, to go more and more into the Narnia-like paradise that is before them. Our heroes spend the last bit of the book doing just that, going further up and further in, going more and more into the joy that has been prepared for them. It's a beautiful picture of the heavenly life promised to all those who believe in Jesus. But I think our scriptures for today from the Apostle Paul would teach that this further up and further blessing is not reserved for heaven. For in the passages before us, Paul urges his brothers and sisters in the city of Thessalonica to this kind of living today. Now, Thessalonica, it was an interesting city in Paul's day. In Acts 17, we read that Paul visited there on his second missionary journey and stayed for three weeks. Luke tells us that Paul taught in the Thessalonian synagogue on three different Sabbaths and that some of his Jewish brothers and sisters were brought to faith in Jesus Christ by his teaching. This did not sit very well, however, with some of the other Jews in town. But the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. They didn't find Paul and Silas there. However, instead, they dragged their friend Jason and some other believers before the city officials on trumped-up charges of sedition and disturbing the peace. Jason had to post bond, meaning that he had to be guaranteed to be peaceful before the city officials on trumped-up charges of disturbing the peace. Jason had, oh, post, I read that. Jason had to post bond, meaning that he had to guarantee a peaceful, quiet community or he would face the confiscation of his properties and perhaps even lose his life. As a result, Paul and his companions had to flee Thessalonica. But when they moved to the nearby city of Berea, the Thessalonian troublemakers followed them and repeated their rabble-rousing in that city as well. Paul was forced to leave his companions, Silas and Timothy, behind while he moved on to Athens. Now, sometimes we forget just how difficult it was for Paul and his friends on their missionary journeys together. Their faithfulness and dedication to spreading the gospel is truly inspiring. But as you can imagine, three weeks in Thessalonica really wasn't enough to found a healthy congregation. Paul and his friends had surely made some progress by that time. But they needed to follow up on the work they had begun. We know that from our first scripture reading that Timothy returned to Thessalonica to carry on Paul's work there. But Paul also did what he could. He wrote two letters, which we call 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We heard passages from both today. And in these two letters, Paul addressed some concerns that the Thessalonians believers had, especially about the end times and the second coming of Christ. But in these letters... Paul also gives one consistent message to his readers. In your Christian life, go more and more. In our Christian lives, Paul says, we must go deeper. We must keep growing. We must keep maturing. We must go further and further in. In our Christian lives, we cannot and must not ever become stagnant. Being a Christian by definition 
means that we are growing. Being a Christian means progressing in our faith as we come more and more like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in our passages for today, Paul specifically urges the Thessalonians to go more and more in three things, faith, holiness, and love. For he says that our growth in these three areas has profound implications for our eternal life. First, Paul encourages the Thessalonians to go deeper in their faith. In our second passage for today, he says, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. We find this in 2 Thessalonians, new teeth. Now I would put... I would put to you that our faith cannot grow without a growth in knowledge. There has to be a content to our faith, my friends, and surely a mixed church like at Thessalonica, which included both converts from Judaism and the pagan Greek religions. There had to have been a great deal of teaching going on. Not only would the Jewish converts have been searching for the Old Testament scriptures with new eyes, But Timothy and other elders would surely have been teaching about Jesus and all in what we now read in the Gospels. They also had Paul's letters, in which they surely read often. Growing in faith means growing in in knowledge, in wisdom, and in the content of what we believe. It means growing in our understanding of the Scriptures, which always leads to growth of belief. And Paul tells the Thessalonians, in our first passage, that this growth will lead him to stand firm with the Lord. The Thessalonian believers also faced persecution. But the more they grew in their faith, the more they were able to stand firm in the face of these trials. But they had to grow in other ways as well. Paul also called them to grow in holiness. Paul reminds them that in Thessalonians 4, that he had taught them how to live in order to please God. And now he urges them to do this more and more. There's that phrase again, more and more. And he then goes to remind them of what he means. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. You should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathens who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. We see that in Thessalonica in Paul's day, just as in America today, one of the major holiness issues has to do with sexuality. Greek culture at this time was notorious licentious. It was not considered at all wrong for a man to keep a wife at home, a mistress elsewhere, and also to consort with prostitutes. That was simply a typical way of life. As long as a man provided financially for his wife and children, he wasn't considered wrong at all. That was the culture Paul was engaging in, and many of these new believers had come out of this way in thinking. Paul was combating all of this by urging sexual purity. He urges these new believers to be different, to go against the flow, to go deeper into holiness, and let to and let God's word change their hearts and their behavior. Now, of course, there is more to holiness than this one issue. We read the rest of the scriptures for a more comprehensive understanding. Holiness is a lifelong quest. Paul teaches here, go more and more into holiness. Keep growing. Keep striving for maturity. But, of course, over our growth in faith and our growth in holiness... We must have a growth in love. Without love, Paul says elsewhere, we are just like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In fact, the whole of the Christian faith can be summed up with that one word, love. And the whole of the law of the prophets hangs on two commandments about love. You'll find these in Matthew. And so here, Paul urges the Thessalonian believers to grow in love. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless 
and holy in the presence of our God and Father when the Lord comes with all his loved holy ones. Later, he says, now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you have taught yourselves by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do more and more. Our, all our knowledge and all our strivings for holiness means nothing if we are not doing so in love. In love for the God who saved us and in Jesus Christ, and in our love for each other, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We all have seen Christians who know the Bible well and who are passionate about holiness, yet they are mean, petty, judgmental, and irascible people. I think I knew a few of those. And that's not what Christianity is all about. The Christian life is about love. Our faith and our holiness should be expressions of our love for God and for each other. And we must grow more and more in this love, my friends. We must go further up and further in. When we do, Paul says, it will have cosmic implications. He calls us to increase our love so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. Elsewhere he says, as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are now suffering. Our increasing faith, holiness, and love are going further up and further in shows that we are worthy of God's kingdom. It shows that our faith is real. Without this growth, my friends, there is no proof that we truly are believers. God's grace put, puts claims on our lives, my friends. When he grabs a hold of us in Jesus Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit, he then calls us to live in a certain way. He calls us to grow, to mature, and become more and more like his son Jesus. Faith without this, my friends, is no faith at all. So we need to go further up and further in. We need to grow in faith and knowledge. We need to go more and more into holiness. We need to have an ever-increasing love. Is that the case at Harrison Presbyterian Church, my friends? Is that the case in our individual lives? Is our faith stronger now than it was? Are we able to withstand greater trials than we did before? Have we grown in our knowledge of Scripture? Do we have greater habits of holiness than before? Are we better at prayer? Are we better at restraining our thoughts and our words? Are we increasing in love? Are we better fathers and mothers, better brothers and sisters, better friends than we were before? Are we kinder, more faithful, less judgmental, and more caring? Is there evidence in our lives and in the life of our congregation that we love Jesus Christ and believe in him? Are we living more and more like he lives? Are we spilling over with his joy? Are we living more and more like he lives? Are we going further up and further in with his hope and power? If so, praise the Lord. Let's keep going more and more. If not, why not? And what will we do this week to begin this process of change? With one or two steps, we will take today to begin this transformation. For we all must be going more and more in faith, in holiness, and love. We must all be gone further up and further in with Jesus, who gave his all for us. Hallelujah to him be the glory. <laughs> right. As Joshua would say, can we have a hallelujah? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs>